Okay, I'm going to come out for one last round of questions, uh, and I've been very patient, so there. Um, thanks. Um, you just said that you find, uh, you think that philosophy is important, mm. um, but I don't understand um, how you say this, and then kind of normally come back to this point made previously about the circular nature of your argument. Now, if you look at the first two premises, two premises of your argument, they would be on to your first conclusion. Um, now, I think it's very interesting your choice of premise there. It seems to me that if you were to take your first premise and kind of analyze that using your previous reasoning, assume where you say the state that the unborn child is a human being, let's make that the conclusion of it, um, from where you kind of you first justified that premise, why you would hold that premise. Now, you said that um, this maybe would, if you're going to analyze this, you'd say that human beings have an inherent rational nature. Mm-hmm. You would also say that the unborn child has an inherent rational nature. Therefore, the unborn child is a human being. It's very interesting because in kind of justifying no, why you're told the first premise, you're using another premise and another conclusion you just come to. So it seems to me that by using your argument here, you kind of use A to justify B, whereas previously you used B to justify A. Not true. And I don't understand how you can hold this kind of cycle. It's not circular. Okay, I'll go up the back there. Changed your argument in that um, during, when you were uh, putting your argument forward, <coughs> that um, the baby lacks certain things like self awareness, sense of agency, sense of biography. Then, when this lady with friends talked about geography, that became your important thing. Actually, birth is the really important thing, and then you led on to the point where you revealed that you actually believe in infanticide. Okay, so your argument did change there, and I'd like to. Well, I know why your argument changed because the person didn't make any sense and then did stand up scrutiny. Now, you said so there's no point when we can discern if somebody is a human being. That's quite an amazing thing. There is no point. You think there's not really any point where we can say this is a human being? That's amazing. There is no point we can decide when somebody's a human being, so we can kill them at any time. When are they human? This is what we're debating. And you just said there's no point when we can decide that. Why have we just glossed over that point? Okay, Mm -hmm. Uh, hands up again, and I'll come to the front. Okay, um, just three, I mean, (coughs) three brief points. Uh, Towards the last round of your discussion, it appeared as though this debate was about the what the law should be about abortion. And I think it's worth clarifying <coughs> it was originally about the anti abortion. So I think when Anne says uh, that Peter wants to force women in the building, they made this debate about what should be allowed. Um, just was worth clarifying that. Yeah. Um, secondly, on this business about conscience, um, again, um, Anne, you say that women should be allowed, so you, you say worse the effect that women should be allowed to work out their own conscientious yeah. decisions and to have the freedom to do so. To the extent that's about what law should be, you might well be right that people should be allowed, within certain limits at least, in a liberal democracy, to, to act as their conscience dictates. Of course, the deeper philosophical point is about conscience. I mean, the odd thing about that is that you know, writers as it was Augustus Aquinas will say that it's always wrong to disobey your conscience. At the same time, your conscience has got to be right. Yes. Your conscience has to be properly educated. So you can't just claim any claim justification and say, oh my, I thought it was right. <laughs> and that just won't do. But you do sometimes find people on your side of the debate, like Catholics for choice, saying this sort of thing. And, uh, I'm not even I, I know. I know, I, know, <laughs> I know you're not. I just, no, I just heard people. Uh, like. But again, uh, just to run off, what really fascinates me is that it's the spat between Peter and the gentleman no. at the front. Because I was having that exact thought when it came to what's really behind this debate. Because it seems to me, it's throughout this debate, Peter's come up with so many lucid coherent points. I mean, you are right, I'm absolutely on lock on so many things in this debate. But here's the problem where I'm still unsure. Premise two here is the problem. Yeah. Um, that human beings have rational nature. Now, counterexample, some human beings, animal capital children and so on, on the face of it, don't have a rational nature because they have no individual potential to become rational. What might it mean to say they have rational nature? One answer might be because they're a member of a species whose typical member has a rational nature. Now, okay, what's typicality? If it's just statistical, I can't see how it has any normative, any moral problems at all. If it's some sort of hybrid between the statistical and the normative, which I suspect something like this is going on in Peter's argument, then I imagine that's how Peter pulls the argument off. So I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just really saying this is what my, my problem with the basis 
of your own. The question is, should you kill them? Hold on, hold on. I never, I've got, I never. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Emily. Um, thank you so much. It's been really interesting hearing everything laid out really clearly. Um, and I'm just, I'm really interested in that you said that we can't pin down personhood. I'm interested in it because it, it is, if you're taking it as something that is almost arbitrarily given to us by the, by the way we display the functions that we have as humans, it's arbitrary. And so we can't actually pinpoint precisely when it happens. So when your child says, do sheep know? Like, is he just realizing that in that moment? Does he become a person right then? So, or if a sheep figures out right then that they're a sheep, do they know from that moment that they're a person onwards? So the moment is unpindownable. You can't ever see when someone becomes a person, which makes the, the whole sort of rationale quite, it makes it sort of seem very arbitrary to say that you can't pin down personhood, so it's okay. Surely, you know, we have this, you said we have a cosmic awe and you sort of like delighted in sort of the fact that we are more than the sum of our parts. But you only ever look at a fetus as parts. And um, you kind of, I think you sort of agreed if you, you know, that how terrible it would be if we prove humanity in the unborn to know that we have been killing so many of them. But surely, if you are unsure of when personhood is, you should err on the side of caution. Like surely if you are unsure, that should be your ethical stance. Err on the side of caution there. If personhood is something that is so sort of nebulous, why can't we why should why should we not just err on the side of absolute caution? Which sort of really the only absolute place is conception for me. Anything else you can say a heartbeat, you can say when brain waves start in the fetus. But that's something that has to, it has to be quite tied to biology if it's not going to be quite nebulous. Can I come back on that? Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm afraid not at the moment. Okay. We're going to have to finish off with questions. Um, okay, so we've got, I'm going to just, if you want to speak, speak now forever. Keep your hand down. <laughs> okay, we've got three more, that's fine. And then I'll bring everyone back in to, uh, to sum up. Okay, down here. <clears throat> um, well, it sort of relates to that, actually. I mean, it's... Um, there is no point of absolute caution. That is the problem, and that is the problem of what Peter's saying. That, um, I mean, all credit to you for saying that you wouldn't destroy an embryo to save a mother's life. But that actually gets to the crux of it, doesn't it? Because you're not treating embryos and women as the same. You're privileging one over the other. Because in terms of pregnancy, I mean, pregnancy isn't a state of two coexisting beings. There's always a conflict that goes on there, internally within the mother's body, as you said, that you know, pregnancy can be a state, I can't remember whether you said it was dangerous or violent, but anyway, it can be both. Um, and, and, you know, one could argue, it has been argued, I would argue that forcing a woman to give birth, forcing a woman to give birth, is an act of violence. Because you are forcing um, her to succumb to the needs of the embryo, which are physically very, you know, um, extreme in many in many cases. Now, obviously, when a woman wants to be pregnant, then you know we absorb these conflicts and we don't see it in that way. And that's all good because we want the baby and we see it all as part of how life goes on. And you know that's all very important. But I do think it's important to recognise that you can't just sort of have this happy world where everyone coexists on kind of some sort of independent level. That if you are saying that it is not okay to destroy an embryo to save the mother's life. You're saying it is okay to destroy the mother for the sake of the embryo, and that's a privileging, it's not an equality. Okay, here. Peter, I thought your last few remarks were, were very telling, actually, particularly with the example you gave about the terrorist and how you wouldn't kill a terrorist. And it seemed to me the point you were trying to make, you made it pretty explicit, was that you believe in moral absolutes. You like this idea of there being hard and fast things <coughs> that you can hold on to and regulate not just your life but everyone else's mm -hmm. life with them. I think that is really problematic because I think you will find that there are hardly any, if, if, if indeed any, moral absolutes. What there are are moral principles. And it's important to, whenever someone formulates a rule such as thou shalt not kill, it's important to remember why they have that rule. So, for example, I would have no problem at all with a terrorist being shot here if, he was, if it prevented him from exploding a bomb so that the rest of us lived. Mm -hmm. 
I, uh, my rules are flexible. I can deal with situations where rules conflict. Um, I, can, I can have different hierarchies of rules. I know what I'm doing with a rule. And I think that very much comes back to Anne's argument, which it seemed to me was a very moral argument about how she included about it was about the secular soul. In other words, it's essentially having an understanding about what life is. And, and hence, having, having rules that guide us, but <coughs> don't determine in any given situation, in a hard and fast, concrete way, what the outcome is. You see, I think you've lost sight of the reason why we have these rules. You've emptied out these rules of their content and meaning. It's a, it's a form of moral evasion. You are merely asserting a rule to avoid you from having to actually confront the harsh reality that life throws up for us in, in all the many different um, conflicts that arise. Okay. And last question of the evening. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of an observation. So have Christians abandoned things like soul in the image of God, etc.? I've heard a lot of religious language from <laughs> that side of the table, but very little from Peter, and I know you're a Christian. Um, I think it's, it wouldn't be a bad thing to you know, do things more overtly like that. I don't know if Anne might have said it to kind of cash you out and it's more faith than reason, etc. But the two go, they go together. And I can hear that you've got the tendency of the, the, the spiritual side is there. And I think for our side, it's got to be about eternal values, spiritual values. That's why we treasure every life. Life of child, life of baby, life of fetus. The whole, the whole, all the stages are just as valuable throughout the person's life. And then on the other side, it comes down to, in many cases, women having more value than the baby. That's, that's kind of the long and the short of it. And then one has to ask, whatever is in the womb, because you don't want to harm anything or anyone, are we harming it by abortion or are we making it flourish? Okay, and just because she, she hasn't spoken before, but you've got 10 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, you said that the difference that you ultimately see in what you <coughs> ask people is that Peter said that it's the DNA beating heart and these kind of physiological, physiological things. And you said that uh, on the other hand, yourself is a kind of secular soul. Uh, don't you think that it goes together? That actually the soul cannot be without this DNA and beating heart. That really, but that, that the soul comes from, that it gives the importance to this DNA beating bar, this matter. That the matter actually matters. Yeah, okay. very good point. <clears throat> very good point. Okay, so I'm going to bring um, the speakers back in to sum up the discussion. Sometimes at the end of these debates, I like to ask them pointed questions, which I think sum up all the issues so conveniently. They look very smart, but uh, this evening you're both on your own, because frankly, there's been <laughs> way too much to talk about. Um, you have uh, f five minutes each, but ideally it would be um, about half that, because we have run quite short of time. Um, Anne, would you like to go first? Yeah, I have to say... Uh Thank you very much for the debate, which I have to say has possibly been the most exhausting two hours I've experienced in some time. Um, but thank you very much for it. I, I can see that this point about a secular soul is now going to track me through the <laughs> entire rest of my, of my uh, work. Um, look, just to say, um, in being kind of vague about the personhood thing, um, just to say what I'm not being vague about. What I'm not being vague about are the elements that I think make up personhood, which I think we've discussed and gone over a number of times about the self-awareness, sense of self, self-consciousness, sentience, sense of biography, all of that. What I think I'm saying that I don't know the answer to, and I'm actually doubtful that anybody can say that they really know the answer to with any sense of integrity, is exactly when that happens. I strongly suspect that these things are, you know, it's a bit like if you, if you look at the, the work that's been done on sentience and pain, 
Well, people who are doing research on sentience and pain will tell you is that it's, there is not some sudden moment where all the little neurons get connected and it's like a light switching on. Oh, it doesn't feel pain. Bang, it feels pain. The, the ex, the, the develop, the, the, we're talking about something that's very developmental and is more like a dimmer switch than an on and off. And the point really that I'm making is that these qualities that I think are really important for us to, for us to consider when we talk about the essence of what we really mean by, by humanity are things that are, can only be acquired after a certain point. They really are acquired at some point after birth. And, and, and all I'm saying is that the reason why I make that point is because there is no way that those qualities, a sense of self-awareness, for example, can be developed in utero. How can you have a sense of self when you don't have a sense of other? You know, how can you have a sense of, of consciousness where you don't have a sense of unconsciousness? It's simply not possible. And I think, you know, coming back on your point about being precautionary and drawing bright lines, that's why actually, for me, birth is a bright line. I'm saying that I, there are some certain things that I wouldn't put my hand on my heart and say, I know exactly when this is acquired afterwards, but I can say that it certainly can't be acquired beforehand and that is why I'm able to draw a particular have a particular moral attitude after birth than I do before birth and I think it is a precautionary thing that I'm adopting in this and I think that that is rational and I think that it's intellectually consistent I do think that the importance of this debate is that it's really shown us that when it comes to the sort of the, the, this whole discussion, whether it's about the status of the embryo, the status of the fetus, or indeed the, 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 the moral status of women in respect of, of abortion decisions, I think what they've shown is that we really do have to balance a number of different concerns and that perhaps like the development of, of self-consciousness there are very few bright lines that can absolutely be drawn except that I think that where there is a very bright line is I think Peter in your arguments which is that you have a particular approach to moral status when it comes to the unborn, which in very many ways you're far more reluctant to apply to human sentient persons after birth than you are beforehand. Because I do think that if you really applied the same degree of rigor to thinking about the decision to, to think about the position of uh, women and their decision-making capacity and what our moral obligations are towards allowing them to exercise their potentiality, then I think you would take a fairly different attitude perhaps than the one you do towards the abortion issue, although perhaps not to the embryo issue. I think we can distinguish those two things out. OK, Peter. OK, so I'm getting the time restrictions, so I'm going to be a bit bitty in my response to the answers in here. Sorry about that, and then I'll <laughs> respond to what Anne has said uh, just to end off. Uh, but can I first say thank you very much again to Luke and to Anne uh, for this has been a brilliant debate. And I hope, I really do hope, that we can now show that you can have a debate which is rigorous, which is long, which actually deals with the issues, which isn't four ten-minute speeches to show off how good a speaker you are and then some silly audience questions. Not that the audience questions here have been bad, they've been good. But the point is, we can have a a really rigorous debate. This has proven it and well done Kings for hosting it and well done to Kings Life Society for really um, showing the way in this. Now, answers. Uh, should I have used um, sort of more spiritual means? No, I shouldn't have because the whole point of the Rights to Life campaign and the Rights to Life argument, it, it is secular, it is humanistic. I'm not a secular humanist, you know, I am a religious humanist, I'm a devout Catholic, uh, I am a former atheist, I can go on that whole debate, but all the arguments I've used here would be things that all people of goodwill could agree on, in my opinion, if they're consistent, if they agree with the metaphysical positions that I've taken and the physical positions I've taken, and I think they ought to. Um, so, and it's interesting that this whole point of secular souls being introduced and, and talked about, because actually I think that 
you would have to introduce a metaphysical dualism on the kind of platonic lines of, oh, there's the soul and then there's the body, or along the, um, uh, uh, the, dark, the Cartesian line of, oh, there's a mind and then there's a body, or the Lockean line that there's some kind of other uh, consciousness and then there's a body. In other words, you have to introduce this sort of person-body uh, dualism in order to justify, I think, if you're not going to use moral duality, which I think you are, you have to use metaphysical duality. And I don't think that works either because we know that we are physical creatures. And in my opinion, if we're going to talk about a soul, the soul is simply the form of the body. I don't introduce that duality, that dualism, I think other people do. And actually, my particular um, vision of that doesn't have to introduce it. We disagree, this chap here, on a meta-ethical meta level. The difference is not that yours is more sophisticated, it's simply that mine's more consistent. You have to have moral principles, you have to have a sense of this is what is right, this is the, the, the uh, law that we apply, and therefore you have to be consistent in it. If you're not going to do that, then you're basically making an ad hoc pragmatic idea, and you have to justify that pragmatism and that ad hocery if you're going to justify your position. I'm not privileging... Oh, where's she gone? Oh, well, anyway. I'm not privileging... Oh, there you are. I'm not privileging uh, uh, the, the unborn child over the woman. What I'm saying is that we have a negative right to life that cannot be violated. We don't have a positive right to violate someone else's negative rights in order to get some, uh, some benefit for us, even if it be the saving of our life. You can't be violent by passivity, by not allowing a woman to kill another human being in even to, to save her life. That's not violence. That's simply a secondary effect of your being consistent in terms of believing in uh, human rights. Um, I think we, I did distinguish... Uh, these two gentlemen, I did distinguish between the uh, capacity, or something called the potentiality for mental functions, um, that is an immediately exercisable one on the one hand, and the basic natural capacity inherent in all human nature that can develop over time. Now, there might be all sorts of reasons that stop that from developing over time, or that stop the capacity from being actualized, but the inherent potentiality is in the human nature, which all of us share equally. We do look at people in different ways. I agree. I'm now I'm going to go on your comments finally to, to end off. We do look at people in different ways, absolutely. We have civil rights and we have absolute rights. My point is that from our nature, we have the same human nature and therefore the same rights for everyone. So that's the same. The civil rights, I agree. The way we treat people is very much different. But actually, my, my argument is not in any way circular or inconsistent because the human being is not a conclusion of my argument. It's simply the premise, which is, I think, rationally proven, that leads to us having this human nature, which gives us the rational nature that gives us dignity and rights. And that's for everyone. That's equal for everyone. You can't, you can't be discriminated against. You, what you have to do is you have to privilege agency, the simply ability to do stuff, or do particularly human, sophisticated stuff, as somehow trumping the natural rights life that we all have. And I don't think you've proven the ethic of radical autonomy and radical self-determination, which I introduced uh, you know, examples of. You haven't given us an account of that that would justify such a trumping. In fact, I think you haven't either justified any kind of account of moral personhood at all. You've given us things like, well, there's consciousness, but ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm not really willing to rely on cosmic awe or subjective senses of compassion or any of this. We have to have a consistent moral framework, which is then legally expressed by which we can say, here are rights and here are how, here's how we account for human dignity so that everyone can be treated in the right way. Uh, so, that's, so I'm just going to end up on this point. Look, it's either our humanity that is the basis of our rights and of our dignity, or it's something a hell of a lot more contingent that allows no one to have ultimate rights whatsoever. This is an abstract metaphysical thing. This is an absolutely concrete metaphysical and physical argument, and it's the only thing that can consistently apply to our rights. Ideas have consequences, and if you have no absolute ontological basis for the deontological rights that are human rights, you have no rights whatsoever, and it's precisely for that reason that the ethic of human dignity that I've experienced and only that ethic can truly safeguard the rights and the values and the dignity of every human being. Thank you. So we thank our speakers. Well, I think we're all rather exhausted, but our speakers uh, deserve <clears throat> particular thanks and praise for undergoing what was an extremely rigorous examination of the issues responding to difficult questioning fantastically well so thank you very much Anne thank you very much Peter it's been absolutely fascinating to listen to um, thank you very much to King's again for hosting the discussion in such a brave way and in a way which can really give voice to the issues